All right, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we went through a few weeks of breaking all those different parts down. And you can say that verse like this and it bears witness to it. But desire before all things the rule of the king and his culture. And all these things will be added into you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for getting into some hard things today, Lord, but it needs to be said. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. When I sought the Lord with all my heart, when I got in to seek ye first, not playing around. Remember, the, nobody can worship for you. People can pray for you, but you got some stuff that you got to do. They might can pray for you, but they can't seek for you. And remember, you can't lay hands on wrong thinking. Amen. And when I sought the Lord with all my heart, he told me to submit to the fivefold ministry. That's some of the first things he said when I finally heard his voice. Submit unto the ministry. In other words, I'm going to be his source. going to be like a Levite. Instead of chasing any kind of dreams and desires, or I need to chase him and I need to get uh, into his word. And he said, study the word to show myself approved. And then he said to, to do that so I can rightly divide the word. Amen. Yes. Now let, 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 me, let, me, let me say this too. I'm, I'm like a lot of most, most guys before I got into ministry, I didn't read much. I didn't. I mean, if there was anything to be read, Kimberly would just, well, read it to me, honey. I wouldn't read books. Would I read the Bible? I'd read a little bit here and there, you know, and what they would have at church, and I'd go home and find it and read it. And, you know, from a young age, you know, I, I had been in, in church before I went buck wild. So I had a history and a background, a foundation of some stuff. But I didn't sit around and just read and read and read. And when the Lord just hit that on me, I had to get way out of my comfort zone. That's all I did then after that, read, 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 read. So the thing I rarely did, now I'm doing all the time. But here's why you know when you're in the, because at first it's like, ah, oh, but then you submit to it, you do it with a cheerful attitude. And then you know what? I got to where, man, I can't wake up, can't wait to wake up in the morning so I can read. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. So he told me to, when I saw him first, he said, submit to the fivefold ministry, study the word to show thyself approved, and to rightly divide the word, to quit my job. Now then, some now then some people be like, "Well, hey, I can do that. That's easy to do." <laughs> Let me back up what was said last week. I was raised in a, in a the, to have a strong work ethic. Yes. Yes. There was no Salvation Army and Catholic social services and one way ministries where I'm from. If you didn't work, you didn't you didn't work out for you. If you wanted to go ahead and booze it up and just be on the street, there was no programs or nothing for you. So people worked. And people even helped those that were in really hard times if they were working. In other words, old man Johnson might let you say, well, just come in here and, you know, can't get you full time, but you can come sweep up or something during, you know, busy hours and, you know, we'll give you a little something, something. But if somebody would, I ain't going to do that. Uh, yeah, well, word gets out about that, and all of a sudden, ain't nobody helping you. And um, so it was a big deal for me to do that. Because, see, what I had to do, because, see, I'm supposed to be a provider for my family. And now, all of a sudden, I'm having to put him as my source, totally. Totally. Totally as my source. Now, if anybody, and especially listening, if you just go out and you're like, well, I've been feeling like quitting my job anyways, Pastor. That just gives me a reason to quit. If God is not telling you to do that because he's going to have you full-time with him, 
then you are making a mistake. And don't blame God for all your sorrows and woes that will come your way. But to quit my job and a few months later, it didn't take long after that, hey, move 660 miles away from familiar where you were born and raised, where you've lived all your life. That was my seeky first experience. And if you'll read through the word, that's a, a lot of a whole lot of other people too. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. First things first. Seek ye first requires effort. Piggybacking off last week just a little bit. Problem solving requires effort. And you really need to go back and listen to last week. So if you're like, what's all this problem solving stuff? Life changing. You need to go back and, and listen to it. Problem solving requires effort. Even when you're asking the Lord what to do. The asking is easy. But, the, but hearing the response, that takes effort. Anybody can have a moment at any given time. Even heathens can, oh, God help me, even if they don't even believe there's a God. Anybody can throw up a prayer. Anybody can speak out of their mouth. That's easy. But it takes effort to hear. And you can't get around it. There's a lot of people throwing up prayer. Well, I've been praying for years, Pastor. Yeah, but how long have you been hearing? Right. Oh, that was good. Right there. I am preaching already. That is good. You can be speaking out of your mouth for years, but are you making the effort to hear? Yes. That takes effort. It takes effort to tune everything going on around you and in you out. Yes, it takes effort to tune all that out. Yes, so you can give 100% of yourself to Him. I've been there plenty of times. I'll get into my prayer and I can hear the Holy Spirit being like, are you done yet? Yeah. Oh Lord, help me with this. Oh Lord, why is this happening? Oh God, no, 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 no. I'm not seeking Him. He already knows these things before I ask. It's, come, let's spend some time together. Yeah. That takes effort. Especially if you're really going through something. It takes effort to put you on hold. Because yeah. everything in you is screaming. Yes, well, he's supposed to be my source, my provider. Listen to yourself. Still all about you. Right. Your provider. You're this. You're this. It takes effort. Man, I'm saying something this morning. Becoming a responsible and self reliant adult, which is the will of the Lord requires effort. Then seeking the Lord's mandate over your life doubles up on that effort. It takes enough effort just to be a responsible and self-reliant adult, but now doubling up on that. Now, okay, well, what's my call in life? What's my purpose in life? It's just so sad. It's just rampant. I mean, I think people that might have been in church 30, 40 years, and it's just like, well, well what's God called you to do? I don't know. Well, they're saved. They love the Lord. But they all have a clue. And it's just sad to me. I mean, it just is. Because if you don't know what you're called to do, you'll never be making progress to get there. That's right. It's just like without a GPS, just getting on the highway and just traveling down any road. And then when you just feel like turning right, you'll turn right. And you feel like turning left, you turn left. And you just keep going for years, and you might be in Mexico one year, you might be in Canada the next year, you might be lost in downtown Detroit one year. I mean, you don't know where you're at or where you're going. You just float around all kinds of different places. But you tell everybody, I have a destination. Well, where's it at? I don't know. I don't know. Just keep putting gas in the car and keep driving around. Well, isn't that frustrating? Yes, it is. It's frustrating. And let's just, can I be honest with you? You do that for so long, you get comfortable with that. It's no longer frustrating. It's the norm. 
you're numb. That's a scary place to be numb. Even if I'm mad at God for something, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do because he's never wrong. He's always right. It's always us at fault. But still, yet, it's like, if I ever become numb to stuff, that's scary because you're not feeling anymore. So even if you're mad, at least you're feeling something. That means you're alive. Hallelujah. Amen. That was a freebie. We are to be God-dependent but self-sufficient. Let's say that together. God-dependent, self-sufficient. Again, God-dependent but self-sufficient. Amen. Keep preaching, preacher. Hallelujah. Most... Most only plan and prepare a few weeks in advance. But in order to move into your God-given destiny, you have to start making preparations years in advance. All right. Told you it's going to be rough. No wonder the kids and young adults of this generation don't want to leave home. Yeah. Some of you are going to like this. Some of you might just be like, Arr. But no wonder kids and young adults of this generation don't want to leave home. Because home is like a complimentary five-star hotel. Right. With built-in housekeeping. It comes with non-refundable cash advance. That means spending money. This five-star hotel also comes with shuttle service. And it also comes with room service. Why would they ever want to leave? And you know what eagles do with your young they make it comfy and soft. They fluff their feathers around it. And them little chicklets, they're just nice and cozy. But when it comes time where they need to be leaving the nest, the eagle purposely starts taking feathers out. So now they feel a thorn here and a thorn there. They purposely make it uncomfortable before they kick them out because they're getting them moved in that direction that this is not where you're supposed to stay. This is where you start, but this is not where you stay. That was good. And we make it sound like our kids can just stay. No, this is where you start. This is not where you stay. It's amazing how you have eagles that can raise kids better than even God's own Kids can raise kids. You're meddling, Pastor. Oh, you just wait. Many in this generation are absent of any real problems. And remember how important problem solving is. We learned last week. Once again, go back and watch it. This generation is absent of any real problems because my generation keeps taking them. So no wonder my generation, y'all are going to like this probably, no wonder my generation is so worn out and taking Prozac, Zoloft, and Xanax while this weak, whiny, and wimpy generation is vaping up on CBD and cruising around in Mama's SUV. If you go to any kind of real Christian counselor that'll be straight with you, it's like, I got so many problems with my kids. And they'll stop you right there. Well, see, that's the problem. What's the problem? You're not giving them any problems. You have the problem. You shouldn't have a problem with your kids. Your kids should be having problems. Coming to you for help. Amen. God helped Abraham. 
That means he assisted Abraham. We had a whole section on that too. Help means assistance. Help doesn't mean that you just sit back and God just does everything. That's not helping. Helping means assistance. What do you need assistance with? You don't need assistance sitting on the couch and flipping through the channels during the day. Amen. He assisted Abraham, but God also made Abraham handle his mistake. Remember that? This all flows together. I don't know what that is. Go back and get caught up with us. God made Abraham handle his mistake. Abraham had to own it. Abraham had to deal with it. And you know what? God will make you handle yours. Including raising your kids. Look at your neighbor and say, you. You are to train. Look at your neighbor and the other neighbor and say, train? train. Now that's probably might be a question mark on the end of that. Train. We use the word raise. I don't see that in here. He says use the word train. If you can't even get the mindset right, how are you going to get the actions right? He said, you are to train up a child. Now we're going to hit a bunch of scriptures. So, Terrence, get ready. Here we go. Proverbs 22, 6. Now we've went from me preaching to now this is God's word. Well, I don't like what you said. Well, Let's see if you like these scriptures. See if you like what God said. Amen. Everything okay? Okay. Okay. All right. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child. Didn't say raise a child. You raise corn. You can raise chickens. You train children. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Why some departing from stuff? Because they never got trained. They just got raised. Once again, just like I've said about this world, we have, you could talk to somebody in this world and have the same words but have different definitions. So you really can't communicate. Because what you said is not what they're thinking. You have a whole different definition in your mind. So many people departing from stuff because they got raised, but not the ones that got trained. See, that's how you can see a lot of people, ah, you know, I raised my kids up in the house of God. I, I, they're departing from stuff. I, you know, I don't know. I'm just thinking that the, that part of the Bible is not true. Baby, you never trained them. Jesus. Let God be true and every man a liar. And that's scripture. Amen. You didn't train. That's why they're departing. You just raised. I am saying something. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Ephesians 6, 4. Yeah, we ain't done. We got a lot of these. Ephesians 6, 4. Uh, that was supposed to be in the NLT version. Do I need to kind of do these some of myself or the things we good or? Okay, Amen. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And all the kids are like, yeah, 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 yeah. By the way you treat them, rather, bring them up with, let's see if he's shouting over this now. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Are you bringing your children up with discipline and instruction? 
I'm telling you what, it's just rampant. I, I, don't, uh, I am going to go personal here, okay? I'm leaving the word for a second. I'm in a grocery store, and I see some kid reaching for something and screaming, and the mom is like, don't put that back. Don't, don't do it. I'm going to count to three. Jesus. One, two. Now, I'm serious. Now, you put it back, and this goes on and on and on. There's no discipline and instruction. And I'm really going to just go up and just might as well, like I said, I'm sitting in your favorite chair with your remote control sipping on your sweet tea right now. I'm all up in your business. But when you, because you want to hit the easy button for you and you don't want to train and discipline and you want to hit the easy button and to make them be quiet, you want the easy route and just put an iPad in front of them? That might be easy for you, but you are ruining them for their future. You're not teaching them anything. Well, I tell you what, if somebody would have, if when I was five years old, or maybe let's go a little older maybe, because sometimes there was, no, we had Sunday school, and then all the kids, yeah, all the kids come back into church. That's the old uh, model that, that I was under. We all went to Sunday school, but when it came to church, the kids and everybody was in there. And you were five years old, and you wanted to act out. You got to act out for the amount of time that it took for mama to get you out the door. And then you didn't act out no more. You come back in, a new creation. Because <laughs> there was things that were not tolerated because they were ungodly. And, it's, and, and, and people these days, it's almost like a, and something brand new. Yeah. Yeah. What is he saying? Some of you online be like, what are you talking about? Well, I don't, huh? Well, that's not what we were taught. Need to get back in the book. Proverbs 29.15 in the NLT. Proverbs 29.15 in the NLT. Well, there, man, there it is. To discipline a child produces wisdom. To put an iPad in front of a child makes them dumb as a box of rocks. When it comes to social interaction, when it comes to being able to respect authority and all these other character issues, they'll be dumb as a box of rocks. Because my Bible says that to discipline a child produces wisdom. But a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. Have you ever seen it too? They're walking out of the store. They're like, oh God. Well, honey, you've not disciplined them. So that's what's going to happen. I told you I was going to get personal. Amen. If it's you, just don't look at anybody else. Don't say nothing. Don't roll your eyes. Nobody will know it's you. Amen. All right. Let's go with Proverbs 13, 24 in the New King James. Why are you picking different translations? Because the point that I want to make is a little more uh, amplified in these different versions. That's why. You can read them all in the King James. It'll say mean the same thing. Just trying to make it easier on you. All right. He who spares his rod hates his son. Oh, how the world is completely opposite. Why are you beating your kids for? You don't love your kids. They don't need all that stuff now. You don't reason with the two-year-old. I was almost as stupid as looking at your two-year-old and said, all right, today we're going to talk about Roth IRAs. 
And how that can compound over a period of time. And by the time you're 20, listen, what we can yield, you wouldn't believe what you can, but you, you can't mess with it. They're going to understand that about as much as you trying to reason with them at two years old. I'm sorry. They don't need reasoning at that time. They're, they can't, that part of their brain hasn't grown enough to really understand And when you spare your rod, you hate, that's what God said. I didn't say it. Well, I don't hate my, are you sparing the rod? You and God better talk this out because guess what? That ain't going to change. And what you believe about truth ain't going to change truth. And how can two walk together unless they agree? You want God to help you with your child, but yet you want to not walk in agreement with God? Come on now. But he who loves him, disciplines him. What? See, that's why you have the one, two, three. I ain't playing with you. That's for real, for real. Now, you don't know. Uh-uh. Why has it got to have all that? Because there's not the promptly. Once again, just like last week, maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> but when, uh, when I got out of hand, the adults around me promptly. And like I said, you got dragged out of the room. There was no wait till we get home. No, it was on now. And you know what? Every, and every parent around is like, well, that's good. Why? Because they know that they're being loved. They're being cared for. They're producing wisdom as the last verse said. Proverbs twenty two fifteen in the New King James. I believe that was the next one. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Even people who could care less about the Word of God, you can say, you know what, there's all kinds of nonsense and kids, they'll agree with you. <laughs> Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Oh, I learned real quick where boundaries were. And that saved me when I got older. Because this is some crazy stuff my friends would do that I just couldn't quite do. Because it was instilled from me. Even when I was 18, had my own car and can come and go as I please, kind of, sort of. There was some, still some boundaries in my life because of these things. Because before I jumped totally into it, I kind of got a check. Oh, wait a minute. Now what's the consequences that going to be? <laughs> Instead of just living for yourself and living for the moment. I mean, I, even, I had real thoughts like, man, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember a, a time I've told this story with my, my wife. I don't know if I've shared it with the church or not, but I can remember we all, after a, just... No, I had a before Christ too. I wasn't always Pastor Bob. And after band practice one night, we had some, it was a, it was a large open because we did that once a week. We had an open band practice. So we would get used to, you know, people being around and, you know, try out new material and see if that song, you know, was it a thumbs up, thumbs down? Do you need to keep it in the set list? And then you toss it because we'd write our own material. And there was a lot of people over that night, and it was a great practice, and we were all partying, and we were all getting lit. And I can remember some of the guys saying, let's go to such and such club. So we all head over there, and I drank way too much alcohol. And uh, I can remember being in the parking lot, and I can remember one of the guys saying, let's go in and then inside a right. I was so buzzed that I couldn't get out and like go into the club. So I just sat in the car and 20 minutes later, <laughs> lights everywhere. I just kind of just leaned in the back seat. What did they do? They went in and incited a riot. And you know how it was. It wasn't just one or two. I went one kind of started up, but all of them were for it. And you know how it is when you go in those situations. I mean, when you're in it, you're just in it. It's like, okay, well, all right. <laughs> you're just going to have to, you know, have your friends back. I've been there. And some of them got 
new pair of bracelets that night. But there was a part of me that's like, I don't want to be a part of that. And even in my stupidness, I, there was still a boundary. Did you know how they have these big, giant, monstrous elephants in a circus while they don't go wild? Because when they're a little, little bitty elephant, they put a rope around them and they put a peg in the ground. And they get conditioned. They can't break from that peg and it's over and over and over again. And then they do the same thing when they're an adult. And you're looking at that and it's like, ha, ah, you got to be kidding me. You could jerk the whole tent down. What's with the little peg? Oh, what it got conditioned to. Oh, you, don't, you, you don't believe that? Well, you might believe this one because you might be one that owns it or knows somebody that does. Having a dog collar around a dog when it goes so far it gets zapped. You can see that dog just going for something 100 miles an hour. When it realizes it's getting close, it just... <laughs> but what happens to a child that doesn't have a peg in the ground or that doesn't have something? In other words, what happens when there's no boundaries in a child's life? Then they'd be become an adult with no boundaries. And you don't have to worry about taking care of them no more because the Department of Correction will. will drive the foolishness far from them. What was that? Proverbs twenty two fifteen. All right, Proverbs twenty nine seventeen. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Jesus. See, you don't want to put the effort in first. They're going to fight you. Their will is not to bend to yours. But that's the whole part they got to learn. They are not the parent. I am tired of seeing households that go in the direction of whatever their child wants. They're, the children are really running the household. But you go through the effort to let them know that you, you mama, you daddy, they ain't. You correct your son. Listen, he will give you rest. Yes, he will give you delight to your soul. So instead of you being out in public and being shamed and having to do all kinds of stuff because they're just running buck wild it's like some kind of caveman out there. What happens is you notice that your son or daughter goes in front of you and before you're like, ah! You notice that they're opening a the door maybe for an elderly person. And you know what that does? Gives the light to your soul. Yeah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. And we're going to do this in the New King James and the NLT. We're going to hit both of these. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. I'm living proof. Man, I'm telling you, I've had some, you know, some whip marks and some bruises when I was growing up. I'm fine now. It's child abuse not to do it. 14, you shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Do you hear that language? Let's go with the next translation and hit those two verses again. Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Why in the world is saying, okay, from people that are my age and older, why is it unsafe to go into Tillman's Corner on a Friday or Saturday night now? Because you've got a whole generation that thinks what I've got up there on the board is hogwash. Now it's not about, you know, leaving your doors unlocked at night. It's like locking them with three locks. And now you carry a gun in your house. Come on. Why? Why would you do that? Well, for protection. From who? From somebody who hasn't been raised right. Trained. Proverbs 19, 18, the New King James and the NLT. We're going to go for two on this one too. Chasten your son while there is hope.
while there's hope. So there is a certain point that when there's hope, yep, that's exactly what it's saying. Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. Hear that language? Don't set your heart on his destruction. Why? Because if you don't chasten your child, they're going to have destruction. This is, listen, God does not want your opinion on this. You can have your own opinion on this, but it's not going to change God's mind. This is how he set it up. And you can be like, well, I just don't know. I don't. Well, okay, but there's consequences involved. So don't go to God about your kids if you're not going to go to God at first about your kids. I told you it's going to get rough. All right, next one. Same one, different translation. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise you will, oh, you will, what? You will, you will ruin their lives. I'm not done yet. Proverbs 15, 5. New King James. A fool despises his father's instructions. I got a foolish child then. Well, we already read verses that, yeah, foolishness is in the heart of the child. You, you got to take it out of them. But he who receives correction is what? Prudent or wise. You can go with adults with that too. A fool despises. That could come from a spiritual father too. Or you could put a pastor or a mentor They despise instruction. That's a fool. But he who receives correction is wise. We'll end with this one for a second. Is that enough scripture for you? I'm going to give you one more. I think I've, God's made his point. Notice how I said that. God made his point already. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. This is in the, yeah, I'm going to go with the NLT on this one too. Listen, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And if you do that, this is going to happen. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Well, didn't the Lord say the same? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what he said. The word is just confirming the word. Repeat them again and again to your children. Well, uh, when I'm having my Bible study, I don't want my kids around. That bores them to death. Well, you shouldn't be saying words like that anyway, speaking death over your kids. Well, it's just words. Uh, you don't understand life and death is in the power of the tongue. So when it comes to serious stuff, it's like, well, you know, I'm taking the church, let them... Pastor Kimberly have them. We'll let Misha have them, whatever. But, man, we're here at the house. I don't want to do that to them. Hmm. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Hey. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. And the Jews took that literally. I mean, literally. They've, they've yeah, phylacteries. They've literally. And, and you can, I can even, when the scripture says that the, the, the Son of Man shall come with healing in his wings, well, the wings are the bottom parts of the garments that they would wear. And you know what they would tie to them? Little scriptures, fauntlets, little scriptures. So basically what that scripture is saying, and the lady of the issue of blood knew that. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. Yes. Yes. See, she knew that language. Yes. What, basically if I could just get a hold of the word. Amen. Not knowing that the word was inside the word. Amen. She was trying to get the outward word. By the, but, hallelujah. Jesus is the word. Write them on the doorpost of your house. 
and on your gates. Well, God's plan for training children is not the same as Dr. Spock. And you will not believe how many people in culture, even in the church, will go with theories of how to train children that come from secular sources and not the Word. And you wonder why things aren't working out. Pastor, pray for me. Pray that my kids will behave. Now listen, it might sound unsympathetic, but I'm going with the word. Yes. It's not that I don't care about your situation. I just care a whole lot more about the word because the only thing that's going to take care of your situation is the word. And I'm not going to come over in your doubt and unbelief because when I do, I'm not in faith. And when I'm not in faith, I'm not pleasing God. And when I'm not in faith, I'm saying that, well, you know, God, you know, it, hmm. maybe God, maybe not God. He's optional. That's what you're saying. When you're getting pity parties, you're just saying your God's not enough. It's not that you can't have feelings and emotions or something. Your favorite pet that you've had for nine years passes away, you're going to be sad. And he feels, he feels that. Jesus wept. He feels that. But when you stay in that, and then those words start coming out of your mouth, you're denying the very faith that last week you said that you were like all in. Just balancing stuff out here. So, Pastor, pray for me. Pray that my kids will behave. No, I will not. Because that's not a biblical prayer. And I didn't get called into the ministry under Dr. Feelgood. But I got called by yod heh hey Jehovah, Yahweh, however you want to say it. The Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai. That's who called me. Not Dr. Feelgood. So that prayer is not a biblical prayer. I will pray for you. Didn't say I wouldn't pray, but I ain't going to pray that prayer. I'll pray for you. But I'll pray for your strength. I'll pray for your patience. I'll pray for your endurance. And that those would increase as you train your child. I'll accept that one clap and three amens. I knew this wouldn't be the most popular day. I was ready for you. I'll pray for wisdom. I'll pray for guidance as you trust the Lord with all of your heart and you lean not into your own understanding, fully believing that he shall direct your path. That's what I can hook up on you about. Once again, help is assistance. Assistance means there's something to assist with. You can't just dump your... You God is not your spiritual daycare. You can't just throw up a prayer like that. Oh, God, do something about my kids and then just step back and just, well, I'm here. It's the heavenly daycare. You got it. <laughs> Expect them to behave when I come pick them up later. That's not biblical. It's not how it works. Sometimes it's like, my gosh, there's some hard stuff out here. But it sorts through all the baloney. Because I want results in my life. And when I, got, when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I've saved for many years, but when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, this word came alive. And I realized there's just a lot of stuff I was doing. It's just religious nonsense. No wonder I wasn't getting any results in my life. 
It might have made me feel good. might have helped my conscience. But I wasn't lining up with kingdom principles. And that's why we do that out here. So, you know, if you really want to build it right, we'll give you the blueprint. Amen. And it's on you. God will hold us responsible. How long have I been going? How long do I have? I'm about done. I might do this. God will hold us responsible to our responsibilities. God will assist us. Yes, he will. He will show kindness to us and mercy to us, being his children. But he will not do for us what he told us to do. I don't have time. I want you to jot these scriptures down because I don't have time to go over them. For instance, when it comes to dealing with the devil, oh Lord, just take the enemy away. Just battle those, just, just oppressed by the... He ain't going to do nothing about that. He's already done everything he's going to do about the devil. But he told you to do something about it. Let's just throw them up here. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. This will give you an idea about it. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, he is your adversary. He's not God's adversary. Why is he not God's adversary? Because God's not had an equal opponent yet. Amen. There's nobody on that level playing field. Amen. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Next verse. So we're to pray, Lord, please take the devil away from me. What does the word of God say? Whom? Who's the whom? You. You are the underlying subject here. You. Resist steadfast in the face. Resist means to actively fight against. Study it out. Actively fight against steadfastly in the faith. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You ain't going through nothing that your other brothers and sisters ain't going through. God's done everything he's going to do about the devil. Devil's your problem now. Until that angel comes down and throws that chain around him and throws him in the bottomless pit, you're to have to deal with him. But you can resist him steadfast in the faith. You have the authority. It's a whole other teaching. James 4, 7. Same kind of language. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. That sounds a lot like seek ye first, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Resist the devil. There it is. You actively fight against the devil. You resist the devil. And what would happen? And he will flee from you. So what God said, maybe if we'd believe even a little bit about what God said, we start seeing some devils leave our life. But you fully submit yourself to God. Listen, they don't have a choice. Do you hear what I said? Yeah. Amen. It's not like our messed up border crisis. Not in God's kingdom. When you submit yourself to God and you resist the devil... That border patrol comes and casts that sucker out. Whether he's kicking and screaming, it don't matter. He's gone. He will flee from you. Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, 27. What did God say? Neither give place to the devil. I mean, even when he was messing with Peter, he says, hey, Satan's desire to sift you is weak, but I've prayed for you. That when you become converted, he didn't say, that's okay, Peter. I got this. Come here. I'm sorry, Peter. Pat, 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 pat. I'm sorry that mean old devil's messing with you. That old rascal. I'll go out and get him right now. You just sit right here. I got it. You never give place to the devil. I told you not to. Mark 16, 15 through 18. I'll stop with this one. Because once again, I think you're getting the point from the word, getting God's point of view. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And by the way, let's just, let me just add this in here real quick. If you've got a modern translation, this might not be in your Bible. That's all I'm going to say about that. 
Move on. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Next verse. So you've got to be saved first. And that means you've got to be saved first. And these signs shall follow them that what? Didn't say them that try it. Them that hope and wish and pray, hope and wish and pray. Hey, I've been in these situations. You better know, you, you better know something, or it'll be like the seven sons of Sceva. You better hear clearly. And when you hear clearly and the Lord told you to address that, because see, I, you know, I made mistakes when I, got, when, when I made mistakes when I first learned all this too. I want to go and try to cast out every devil I saw. And it didn't work every time. And then the Holy Ghost brought it to my attention. Well, my servant Paul was being bombarded by the spirit of divination week after week. And, and Paul did what? He, keep his, he kept his mouth shut until finally the Lord said, all right, go ahead and take care of it. Just like even healing too. It's like, you know, the, the, the man at the temple that Peter and John rose up from birth. Well, if you'll read it very carefully, they sit him there daily at the temple. So that means even Jesus went in, in and out and saw this guy and didn't do anything. Peter and John went by this guy a lot, didn't do anything. But then the day came when. Remember, for all my faith school, faithful faith comes by what? Amen. See, you're trying to have faith cast out of devil and God never told you to do it. Amen. These shines shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Next. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You got to believe, and you cast out that devil. You hear from God, actively resist, and he's got to flee. The very fact he told you to do something means you have the ability to do it. Otherwise, he would be unjust in his requests. I'm almost done. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to get to eat in a minute. God will not relieve us. For all those watching online, we're having dinner right after church here, so that's why I said that. God will not relieve us from problem solving. But he also will not leave us nor forsake us. He wants us to lean on him and trust him for help. That's assistance. Listen to God before you act and learn at a cheap price what others paid a hefty price to learn. Jesus. My pastor has a whole message on this today, but I'm just going to give you just one little nugget. If you can't be teachable and hearken to the voice of mentors in your life, then the only avenue the Lord has to teach you through is pain. I can't teach you but through mistakes because you won't listen to nobody. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. All right. Well, you can get there, but it's going to be a hard road for you to get there because you're going to have to learn through pain. It's not his first choice, but he'll use that avenue as a last choice because you're a stubborn self. Follow the voice of the Lord, and when you blow it, own it. And ask the Lord for wisdom to fix it. And then do what he tells you to do. I mean, the very fact you're there in that situation is because you didn't do what he told you to do. This is noteworthy right here. Again, listen. He will help you, which is assist you. But he will not live your life for you. He will live in you and through you, but not for you. Amen. 
He treated Israel differently in the promised land than he did bringing them out of Egypt and wandering in the desert. But even though he parted the Red Sea, they had to walk through it. Even though he produced manna, they had to gather it. He gives food to the birds, but they have to go get it. And being crucified with Christ is not... I mean, there was a point that you really want the overflow in your life? Well, then you've got to come out of a wilderness mentality. If you're living from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle, you're not on the blessing system. You've still got a poverty mindset. Because here's what a poverty mindset says. Man. Notice he never put a... In the wilderness, he said, you can only have this much. I'll provide it for you. You've got to get it. you still got to get it. But I will provide this for you. But you only get this much. When it come to the promised land, there was like as much as you want, it's on you. All right, Lord, we'll strap up my donkeys and get behind it and plow my field. I ain't doing that. It wasn't until early this morning I got this revelation. But a give up and quit when times get hard is a poverty mindset. You won't push through. You don't know how to overcome adversity. You won't lean on the Lord to get you through the storm. Since the st <laughs> and, and if you have that an attitude, then the storm will probably go through you instead of you going through it. And you give up and you quit. But you want the promised land. That field is not going to take care of itself. The livestock's not going to take care of itself. Well, I want a thousand cattle. That's a lot of work. But you can do it. God didn't say no. As much as you want, you can have. But it's not going to get done for you. You do the work. But I will bless what you put your hand to. That's my part. And we got so many Christians today that we like them overflowing with milk and honey. But I ain't going to get up early in the morning and pick weeds out of my garden. They'd rather eat seed than sow seed. If they do have to work something, they just want a little bitty garden because it's a little bitty work, so they get a little bitty harvest. So I'll put my sand to something so he'll bless it. Not too much. Amen. Stand to your feet. Being crucified with Christ and not living your life according to the flesh... Listen, doesn't mean that you have alleviated yourself from responsibility and effort. Actually, it's quite the contrary. If you really do that, you will have a progressive purpose that will be fulfilled by many assignments along the way. As you do it His way, not yours. It's a poverty mindset when we quit and give up. I mean, think about that. You got a group of people that saw rivers turn into blood. Darkness fall over Israel. I mean, all over Egypt, but not where they were at in Goshen. You saw the firstborn die everywhere, but not in your camp. You saw a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day following you around. You saw a sea split open. You saw manna fall from heaven. You saw quail purposely falling low that you can just grab it. You saw water come from a rock. Listen, I'm saying something here. And the first tall person you see, oh, we can't go in there and do that. God's not able. Hmm. 
Hmm. After seeing all that, and now you afraid to talk people? What? Really? Because you know what poverty mindsets will say? I'm done with this. We need to go back to Egypt. That's a poverty mindset. Anytime you're wanting to go back to familiar, you've got a poverty mindset. Hmm. Oh. Because the overflow takes effort. The overflow of blessing was not in the wilderness. It was in the promised land where there is farming and fighting. And it both takes effort. That's why we need to seek first. First things first. First.